In the history of the kings of Britain, Geoffrey of Monmouth writes the story of how King Aurelius wanted to commemorate soldiers who had fallen in battle fighting the Saxons. Merlin suggests to him that he go to Ireland to retrieve a circle of stones that was originally built by giants. Aurelius sends his army, but in the end, the stones can only be moved through the artifice of the wizard Merlin to Salisbury. Today, those stones are known as Stonehenge, perhaps the world's most famous Neolithic monument and an iconic symbol of the British Isles. After the construction of Stonehenge, which itself took some 1500 years, was completed, much of the story of how and why it was built slowly faded, but the grandeur of the monument remained, and later people grasped for interpretations of how and why it was there. Some of those interpretations turned out to be fantastical, but others have been proven to be surprisingly accurate. The surprisingly long history of the investigation and interpretation of Stonehenge deserves to be remembered. Despite several millennia of people trying to interpret the meaning and purpose of Stonehenge, some of what we know about the enigmatic monument is surprisingly recent. For example, we can now date the origin of the monument. Stonehenge was begun by late Stone Age people circa 3000 BC. The first monument comprised a ditch, an embankment within which stones and wooden enclosures were erected. One purpose of the original monument was the burial of cremated remains. In 2013, a team of archaeologists excavated cremated bone fragments from more than 60 sets of human remains, and carbon dating of those remains is how the approximate age of the monument can now be determined. While DNA could not be extracted from the fragments, in 2018, a group of scientists from Oxford University used new developments in strontium isotope analysis to learn something about the remains. Put simply, stone from different locations will have different isotopic composition, and the ratio of isotopes found in calcium, such as bones, can be used to determine roughly where the person originated. The scientists, writing in the journal Scientific Reports, concluded that at least 10 of the 25 cremated individuals analyzed did not spend their lives on the Wessex chalk on which the monument is found. That is, many of the cremated remains were people not native to the area. Further, the scientists argue, combined with the archaeological evidence, we suggest that their most plausible origin lies in West Wales. The connection to Wales is fascinating, as we now know that many of the stones used to construct Stonehenge, these smaller blue stones, originated from quarries in southwest Wales, and were quarried about some 400 years before they were erected on the plains of Wilshire. The term blue stone does not describe a specific type of rock, but is a loose term meaning foreign or not intrinsic stones. Excavations in Wales have located the origin of the blue stones at Stonehenge, a type of dolerite, and evidence from tools at the site suggests the stones were quarried around 3000 BC, contemporary with the burials at Stonehenge, but some 400 years before the stones were placed at the monument. Their use during those 400 years remains unclear. A second major phase of construction began between 400 and 600 years later. This is when most of the larger sarsen stones were erected and the early stones were rearranged. Sarsen stones are a type of post-glacial sandstone that are found on the Salisbury Plain and that are so associated with Neolithic monuments like Stonehenge and nearby Avebury that their very name, a derivative of Saracen stones, means that they are assumed to be pagan in origin. This period of development produced a monument much like what we see today, including astrological alignments to key solar events. However, no sooner had this phase been completed when major changes started to occur across the British Isles. A new culture arrived, a culture that buried their notable dead with extensive grave goods, including cups for drinking mead. The unique shape of these cups gave rise to the name Bell Beakers, and the culture was given the same name. Only recently has DNA evidence shown that the Bell Beaker people were actually the first Indo-Europeans to reach Britain, bringing not only new burial practices, but also new languages and metallurgy. Over the next few centuries, up to 90% of the population of Britain was replaced, by the newcomers. Bell beakers still contribute the most DNA to the modern British population, as well as fair hair and skin complexion. The process by which the Neolithic inhabitants were replaced is not well understood. There's little evidence of large-scale violence or intermarriage. However, it is clear that these new people adopted Stonehenge as their own and made further changes. A grand avenue from Avon River to Stonehenge was constructed. The Bell beakers also started to fill the surrounding landscape with their distinctive tombs. From their placement, it's clear that anybody who was anybody wanted to be buried within sight of the monument. Changes continued. 
Around 2100 BC, the blue stones were rearranged around the sarsen stones, and finally around 1500 BC, new pits were dug within the monument, but then left open to the elements. But burial in the area around Stonehenge continued, evidence that people continued to actively use the monument well after construction ceased. But exactly how the monument was used and how that use might have changed over time is still unknown as the story was essentially lost for several hundred years before it was picked up again by later people. You might be surprised to find out that the earliest written description of Stonehenge may be from ancient Greece. The 4th century BC historian Hecateus of Abdera writes, And there is also on the island both a magnificent sacred precinct of Apollo and a notable temple which is adorned with many votive offerings and is spherical in shape. While we can't be certain that this comment describes Stonehenge, a description of a round monument dedicated to a god of the sun seems rather obvious and raises the possibility that a thousand years after construction ceased, some memory of the original purpose of the site remained. After the first century AD Roman conquest, the people of southern Britain were known as the Romano-British. The Romano-British were aware of Stonehenge and other Neolithic sites in Britain and made regular visits to them. In fact, historian Ronald Hutton notes that more pottery from the Roman period has been found at Stonehenge than from all periods of prehistory. Moreover, votive offerings made at the nearby Neolithic Pyramid Mound at Silbury Hill suggest that the Romano-British still use the site for religious veneration. Unfortunately, early excavators destroyed much of the context for the Roman remains, and so it is difficult to draw any further conclusions about how they interpreted these sites. The first medieval description, and in fact the earliest known definitive written record of Stonehenge, was recorded by the British cleric Geoffrey of Monmouth in the 12th century. Geoffrey helped to popularize tales of King Arthur, and while his historiography was considered credible in the medieval era, it is considered unreliable today. Setting aside his claim that the stones were moved by Merlin, his account posits two important archaeological theories. The first is that the site is a burial place, especially for warriors, and the second is that the stones were transported from Ireland. Today we know that the blue stones were transported from Pembrokeshire in Wales. However, archaeologist Leslie Grinsell notes that it is, has for many years been known that this part of South Wales was settled by Irish peoples. Geoffrey would therefore have associated the Irish with this area. Grinsell concludes, the evidence therefore suggests that in his account of the transport of the stones, Geoffrey was either quoting from a reliable written source not known to have survived, such as a piece of Welsh literature, or stating a strongly held tradition. If so, that represents some sort of stored knowledge that had survived some 3,500 years. Whether or not Geoffrey recorded a tradition passed down over more than 3,000 years or made a lucky guess, it is remarkable that he was correct that the stones were transported from the West. And whatever the source of his knowledge, Geoffrey provided the accepted history of the monument for the medieval period. The Renaissance kindled a, a new appreciation of classical history and a wider dissemination of ancient texts. The British, like many others, were keen to recognize the pedigree of their culture, and that instigated more investigation of prehistoric sites. English antiquarian William Camden began writing Britannia, an early encyclopedia, in which he described the major monuments of Britain in 1577. Of Stonehenge, he lament with much grief that the authors so notable a monument are thus buried in oblivion. But theories abounded. The first known excavations at Stonehenge occurred in the early 17th century. The work prompted a visit by King James I, who commissioned architect Inigo Jones to study the site. Jones argued in 1655 that Stonehenge was a Roman temple. Of the theory that the site was the work of Druids, he said, Stonehenge could not be builded by them. In regard, I find no mention there were any time either studious in architecture. Jones argues that Druids preferred natural settings for their worship. Jones' position that the temple was the work of Romans became prevalent at the time. Antiquarian John Aubrey made an extensive survey of Neolithic monuments from 1665 to 1693. His studies of stone circles in other parts of Britain led him to disagree with Jones and conclude that the monument was built by native inhabitants, most likely the Druids. William Stukeley, a physician, clergyman, and antiquarian, often described as the father of British archaeology, working in the early 1700s, made the argument against Jones more cogent by pointing out that Romans would have used Roman building measurement and proportion. Noting, we cannot think that a temple should not shew its founders by the scale in which it is formed. Stukeley supported the notion of Stonehenge as a Druidic temple and began the serious consideration of how the site might have been put to ritual use. 
While he is recognized for his fieldwork and detailed drawings, some of his notions, including the claim that Druids practice an early form of Christianity, were somewhat fanciful. He wrote of the Druids, Our predecessors, the Druids of Britain, though left in the extremist West to the improvement of their own thoughts, yet advanced their inquiries upon all disadvantages to such heights as should be made our moderns ashamed, to wink in the sunshine of learning and religion. At the dawn of the industrial period, the idea of a pre-Roman Stonehenge was well established and the general layout of the site was well documented. Wealthy amateur excavators came into the picture doing significant excavations at Stonehenge and nearby sites. You know, by the end of this period, the science of excavation would be much more defined, but early on, much knowledge was lost in the rush to find treasures. Sir Richard Colt Hower epitomized the era. A wealthy man with an interest in antiquities, he wrote a history which summed up and extended the existing knowledge of Stonehenge. He also financed extensive excavations in the area. A striking feature of Hower's discovery is the scrutiny of early Welsh literature for knowledge about Druids and Stonehenge showing an appreciation of oral traditions and what they might say about prehistoric sites. People at the time became fascinated with the Welsh and stories of Merlin or Marthen in Welsh. Howard's work also described the geological features of the stones and used this analysis to identify local sources for the Sarsen stones and to dispute a local source for the blue stones. Howard made a note of artifacts found during excavation, which he discovered in layers. On this basis, he posited a theory that the site consisted of distinct building phases, as supported by the stratification of finds. For the remainder of the 19th century, the most important discoveries did not occur on site, but in the general advancement of the understanding of prehistory in Europe. Danish archaeologist Christian Jurgensen Thompson played a major role in the systematizing of prehistory. Prior to this, Stonehenge had been attributed to Celts and Druids primarily, because no one had yet appreciated the time and people that came before the Celts. By the end of the century, an outline of Bronze Age and Neolithic timelines and extensive cultural artifacts from across Europe allowed a reappraisal of Stonehenge. With this reappraisal came the understanding that Stonehenge predated even the Druids and could not have been built by them. As a result, modern Druids had to appeal to the European Court of Human Rights to force the UK government to allow them to practice their religion at Stonehenge. The astounding monument called Stonehenge, a word which is derived from the Saxon and means roughly hanging stones, is so ancient that the study of its history is literally ancient history. If Hecateus was indeed talking about Stonehenge, that leads us to two astounding conclusions. One is that some remnant memory about why the monument was built managed to survive as oral tradition for more than a thousand years and make its way all the way to ancient Greece. And two is that after more than 2,000 more years of study of that history, there's still much that we don't know. Geoffrey of Monmouth is also just as intriguing. If you set aside fanciful things like the idea that the stones were moved by the magic of Merlin, the fact that he knew that it was used as a burial site and that the stones came from Wales was not something that had been confirmed by excavation. He says that he got that from local sources, and that suggests that the local people living around Stonehenge had managed to remain just as part of tradition some truth about the monument for a period of more than 4,000 years. And it's very difficult to write off those insights as being merely you lucky guesses. But just as amazing as the truth that managed to persist is the stuff that we still don't know. A 400 year long discussion over whether Stonehenge was built by the Druids or by the Romans was thrown on its ear by the relatively recent discovery that it predates both. Much of what we know about Stonehenge with any degree of certainty comes from the dedicated work of archaeologists over the last few decades. There's still many gaps to fill in, and as we fill in those gaps, hopefully we will learn more about the people and culture that built Stonehenge. But it is a monument so astounding, so ancient, that the study of its history has become history itself. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. And I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.